Buddha started his teaching was something that everyone knows. Suffering, stress, pain. And that fact is pretty amazing. You look at all the other different religions and philosophies in the world, and so many of them start with abstractions, things you can't know. And you have to accept them as basic principles. Whereas the Buddha starts not with a basic principle, but with a basic problem. There's suffering. And where there's suffering, there's the desire to get away from it. There's the desire to gain release from it. He once said that the two reactions to suffering are one, bewilderment. Why is this happening? And then two, is there someone who knows a way out? And for many people, that combination of bewilderment and search leads them in all sorts of weird directions. But you realize you can take that, those two reactions and you can train them so you actually do lead to an end of suffering. Otherwise the bewilderment is ignorance and the search for a way out is craving. And the combination of ignorance and craving usually leads to more suffering. We found that there was a way you can take those tendencies and lead them to the end. The desire for an end of suffering is assumed. And the fact that we're bewildered, we're bewildered, that's the problem that he tries to solve. And he solves it by having us focus directly on what the issue is, the suffering in and of itself. There's a description of right view in which he says even the concepts of being and non-being should be put aside and simply watch where there's suffering. You don't have to interpret it any further than that, simply where there's suffering or stress. When it's arising, you know it's arising. When it passes away, you know it's passing away. That's the beginning, because you want to see what arises and passes away along with it. So try to keep things immediate in your practice. The issue is right here, right in front of your nose, right in your own heart. And if you get abstract, you get away from the actual problem, and you also get away from the solution. That's the second thing that's amazing about the Buddhist teaching. The solution lies right here, too. It's something we can all know as well. Simply, we haven't been paying careful attention. So this is why we work at concentration, why we work at meditation, is to pay very, very careful attention to what's right here, right now. Tune into this level of awareness where you know for sure where there's stress or suffering arising, where you know for sure where it's passing away. So much of Buddhist philosophy is the story of how people don't want to look right here. They want to find you know, basic principles, deal in abstractions. So we have to keep pulling the mind back, because the mind tends to think in abstractions, and that pulls it away from the problem and it pulls it away from the solution. You want to bring it right back here, what you're doing right here, what you're experiencing right here. So what are you doing? We're trying to bring the mind to concentration, we're trying to bring the mind to a state where it can be mindful, alert, where it can be discerning, so, it can, so that it can see what's arising along with the suffering. And when suffering is passing away or stress is passing away, what's passing away together with it. Always try to keep things centered right here, because the further away you wander from this spot, either in terms of abstractions or thinking, well, maybe that place over there might be a good place to practice, or maybe this place over here might be a good place to practice. We're trying to get it all figured out somehow. You're getting away from the problem, and you're also getting away from the Buddha's solution. So he gives you a conceptual framework, but the purpose of that conceptual framework is one to keep pointing you back here. It's like a fence or a snare. As you're wandering away, he snares you and pulls you back here. And then while you're here, he gives you some standards against which to judge things. How is your meditation going? What have you found in your meditation? Is it as far as the meditation can take you, or is there something further? That's where you have the maps of the different stages of concentration, the analysis of karma, the three characteristics. These are all used as maps, standards of judgment. So you can test what you've got. It's like he says, out there in that yard someplace is, is a treasure. And you recognize the treasure because it fits in with these 
standards. And he gives you a, a method for searching. Beyond that, he doesn't go into a lot of description of what that treasure is, or of why the treasure is there. Simply that it's there, and this is how you find it. When you keep your practice close to the ground like this, you're sure to find what's hidden in the grass. And you find other things hidden in the grass besides the treasure, but that's why we have the standards, like the three characteristics. You test it. Is there any, any change there? Is there any stress in that experience? Well, in that case, it's not the treasure. You don't want to identify with it. You don't want to hold on to it. You use it sometimes as you use states of concentration. But you don't want to stop there. There's more. So even though we read up on the Buddhist teachings to get a general idea of what it's all about, the teachings are meant to keep pointing us right here, right now, where there's stress, where there's suffering, where the stress passes away, and to keep our level of awareness on that mode of perception. Presence, absence of stress. We could elaborate further from this, but that gets away from the solution. So look at what you're doing. Is there anything you're doing that's unnecessary, that's causing an unnecessary burden for the mind? Just drop it. As with any skill. As we're saying today, it's like learning how to walk. When you first walk, you use as many muscles in the body as you can, because you're afraid of falling over. And you don't know which ones are necessary and which ones aren't, and so you tend to use too much. And as a result, the, the walking is a very laborious process. But as you begin to sort out which muscles have to be involved and which ones don't, the walking becomes more graceful, less of a burden, less of a less of an effort. And it's this way. Follow the same process of your meditation. To get the mind to settle down requires one set of skills or one set of activities. Once it's beginning to settle down and get really centered on the breath, the breath feels comfortable. You find that a lot of the techniques you use, a lot of the guardrails you put up for yourself, you don't need anymore, so you can drop them. And it's this simple process of seeing what you're doing that's causing unnecessary stress and learning how to drop it. All the basic teachings lie right there. The path lies right there. The Four Noble Truths lie right there. Simply that as you get more and more acquainted here with the present moment, you get more sensitive. You catch things that you didn't see before, things you assumed that they simply had to be that way. Well, they don't have to be that way. So keep your attention close to the ground right here. As John Lee once said, the Buddha found awakening right at the tip of his nose. It's right here. The potential is right here. It's simply that we haven't developed our powers of observation to the point of sensitivity where we can see it. But we won't see it by looking someplace else. Keep coming back right here, right here, right here. Noticing what you're doing, noticing what you're experiencing, and getting very, very sensitive to both.